Oh, praise the Lord. So good to be in the house of God together. And uh, as you know, today is uh, Father's Day. So, wow, this is a wonderful day to really celebrate all papas in the house of God. And could I have all the fathers in Tampanese and Woodlands to just all stand? Come on, let's give them a hand. And you know what, dads? On behalf of the Lighthouse Church, we want to say that your family loves you, your children respect you, and you are greatly esteemed. And we want to trust that God has so much wonderful plans in store for you. And for the rest of us, could we just stretch our hands to all the dads here? And we just want to pray together that God is going to continue to strengthen all papas in the house of God. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for every single father here. Lord, you have raised them up. The years have not been easy. Times have not been easy and there's been challenges, but Lord, you have been the lifter of their heads. And through them, we've seen unction and resource and influence. And through them, Lord, our families are blessed. So we pray, Lord, for the double portion of anointing to be upon all our fathers. Fathers, you are the priests in a household. You are kings in the land. You are protectors and providers and God has raised you up. And we just pray, Father, that the next season of all our dads here will be tremendous. We're going to see good days ahead. Plentiful, bountiful blessings of the Lord flowing down from your throne room into the Father's and into the household. We give you thanks. We bless every single dad. And all of us say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Give the Lord praise. And dads, you may sit now. Praise God. Well, good news is that straight after the service, uh, we have actually refreshments outside uh, in Woodlands, outside the lobby, and in Tampanese, uh, in a side terrace. So all you dads, when you go out and you smell food, it's yours, okay? So you get some food outside. Uh, so we, <laughs> let's give the Lord praise. Well, and so some of you are thinking, Pastor, let's keep the sermon really short so that we can go and makan a bit. Okay, I'll try my best. I'll try my best. Uh, today we are still on the series about God moving in our work. And as always, it's so important that we invite and welcome the Holy Ghost. So just stay seated, but could we all lift up our hands wherever we are and just take a few moments to welcome Holy Spirit here. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We need you. We need you, Holy Spirit. Put a fire and a flame in our hearts. Show us the way. Holy Spirit, you are our guide. You are all wisdom. You are our counselor. You are our helper, the Word of God says. Holy Spirit, lead us into all truth. Thy Word is truth. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. One more time, can we just say it together? Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Come on, say it again. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Final time, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Okay, let's get going. Um, we're going to talk about how to see fruitfulness in our lives. And this is a sermon for everyone, but I want to focus on the dance, if that's okay, and kind of pitch it as a Father's Day message. But I believe it's applicable to all genders, but specifically, I want to talk to the dads. And fruitfulness is something that we want to see. Like, for instance, when you first started out working, none of us say, I want to work for free. I want to work and not get a paycheck. I want to work and not be able to provide for my household. I want to work at not advance. No one says that. Like, the minute we stepped out, perhaps from army and then some tertiary education, and then we jumped into the workforce. As dads, or I should say as men, we're seeing where is the place that I can shine, I can advance. And really, the biblical statement is fruitfulness. That's the issue. It's how do we be fruitful uh, in our lives? That means when we, if you see the seed form, the study, the learning, uh, the exposure, uh, the growing in your craft, the hard work, the toy, uh, all of it is seed form. 
And then at a certain point of time, you are messing enough so that you are seeing the fruits of your labor. The job went well. The project was accomplished. Um, certain things you found headway. You can clinch a new deal. You are growing in the work that God has called you. You are being promoted. You're seeing fruits. Now again, it's not about uh, how high do we climb as much as the whole idea of seeing fruit. You see, because just an example, um, some people, even men, have a distinct advantage, obviously. They may come from a more prestigious or rich background. So obviously, they have a head start. So I'm not talking about how much fruit. I'm talking about just simply fruitfulness. Right? The person that came from a multi-millionaire family, obviously, they have more access uh, to opportunities. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about scale of fruitfulness. I'm just simply talking about fruitfulness because that's the worst thing in a man's life is you work hard and at the end you don't see fruit. So that's what I want to tackle today. Not how much fruit, just the whole biblical understanding of, Lord, I want to see fruit in my life. I've been working 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, Where's the fruit? I want to see the fruit of God. And so I hope that this message will help at least uh, for us to understand this idea of fruitfulness. Let's get to point number one. Write this down. Point number one. Trust steadfastly in the Lord. Now, I want to be very candid. You know, if I talk to different uh, Christians around the world, different pastors in Singapore, and I ask them, is it easier for men or women to trust the Lord? You want to know what's the answer from these pastors? Typically in most churches, even in Singapore, uh, typically the ladies trust faster. It's a very interesting phenomenon, right? Men take a longer time to trust uh, that God will provide. I, I'm not sure why. Perhaps it's just the way it is, right? So men, this is where some of the challenge is. When we say trust that fully, steadfastly in the Lord, honestly, the first thought many of you men have is, maybe my wife should do that, but my daughter should do that, but not me, not my sons, right? And because perhaps you were built with that alpha thing, perhaps you have this masculine idea where by trusting steadfastly in the Lord, it seems like we are weak. Can I destroy that notion? Whether you are male or female, it doesn't matter. If you say you be a Christian, then our implicit and explicit place of trust is not in our skills. Because you and I need to know that skills will fade. Giftings will fade. Talents will fade. Influence will fade. You're not always going to be as influential as you are now. Your circle might fade. Your contact points might fade. Your health might fade. Right? Right? So that's not the issue. The issue is, where do I put the locus of my trust in the Lord? Uh, Is there a need to change a mic? Okay, all good. All right. Let's look at Jeremiah 17, 7. And I want you to see the words here. It says here, blessed is the man. What does it say here? Blessed is the man. So, by the way, when it says man, it's talking about men and women. But I, I want the man to see that Hey, look at the verse. It says, blessed is the man. You say, pastor, I want to be blessed. Then trust the Lord. It says, you are blessed if you trust in the Lord whose trust is the Lord. Notice, it says double. I want you to see it's how amazing this is. It says, you trust in the Lord and you make sure that your trust is the Lord. So, what's the difference you say? Both are the same, but it want to emphasize a point. Men, listen closely. You must trust in the Lord. You want to see blessings? You really want to see blessings? It's time to put some focus away from yourself and put it on the Lord. You have to depend on Him. Here's what men do. I trust that I'm strong enough. I trust that I'm smart enough. I trust that I have the skills. I trust that I've put in the time. And so... I should get ahead. And in the natural, it does make sense. 
But you and I need to know that there's a favor of the Lord that is exponential. It's very important you understand this. Um, I'll give you a simplest context, okay? How many of you believe in this statement? Uh, it's not a foolproof statement, but how many of you believe in this statement? It is not what we know. It is who we know. Now, I'm not saying it's a foolproof statement, but there's a lot of truth in that, right? I'll give you one classic example. Let's say you are urgent, okay? Brother and sister, you are urgent to buy a product that is very hard to find. So you use all your skills, right? You check the internet, you, you find every single way, you put your knowledge base to get that item and you say you desperately need it. And then you find out it's not what you know about the product, it's who can actually be that open door who is that uh, uh, lobang? <laughs> we understand the word lobang, right? It's the who, not the what. Who can I speak with that can open the door of blessing to me? And let's say one of your close friends found out, say, hey, you know what? Guess what? The supplier is my brother. Woo! Praise the Lord. Hey, brother, you know, we are best friends for so long. Can you please talk to your brother for me? And then your, your friend would say, you know, hey, on, a lot of people are trying to buy this. Like, there's already a waiting list, man. But okay, you know what? Because I know you, let me talk to my brother and get it done. And then within a few weeks, you find out, wow, they reserve something for you. You say, Pastor, what does this analogy have to do with God? The Bible says God owns a cattle of a thousand hills. The Bible says that God owns this whole world. If you say, Pastor, I really want to see blessings flow, but you're not putting your trust in God. I, 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 I'm going to tell you your blessings are limited. That's the honest truth. Because it's not just what you know. It's who do you know? God, you own everything, including my boss's company, including my competitor's company. You own everything. They just don't know it yet. Everything's on loan on this earth. You own it all. You own it all, God. Lord, as I trust in you, would you open the right doors? I need favor, God. I need your favor upon me. And if you say, Pastor, that sounds strange. It's not strange because you and I have many times, men, wanted the favor of someone higher up. I tell you what, let's go right to the top. Let's go to him. Amen. Men, please hear this. It's for you. Please don't relegate trusting in God to your daughters and your wives. I, I know this is an implicit problem with men. I know this. I know this. Because sometimes in the church, when I say the word trust in God, I see the ladies responding better. I see the men just tuning off. Don't tune off! Men! Pastor, I want blessings. Then trust in the Lord. Who else can give you real blessings? Who else can give you favour? If God opens the door, Honestly, who can shut it? You say, Pastor, I can think of a heavy weight lifter that can shut it. Are you sure? Do you know that God can just send a flu and the heavy weight lifter would fall flat? I'm just saying, you must understand the point. God opens the door, who can shut it? Check out the next verse in verse 8, very quickly. He's like a tree planted by water. Talking about you and I, if we trust in the Lord, Right? Okay, it's, it's, it's bigger on my phone. Let me see this. He's a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green. Look at, look at it. It's describing you, men, if you understand this. It is not anxious in the year of drought. This, this is what happens. Lord, I need favor. And I see all closed doors. I put my seed in this plant. I put my seed in this vineyard. I put my seed in this area and I'm not seeing the growth. I'm not seeing the fruits. I'm not seeing the harvest. I need it, Lord, for my family. What does it say? If you trust in the Lord, you don't have to fear. Even in the time of, listen, listen, drought. You say, Pastor, why is this important? Recession is coming. Okay, folks. You can try to pray recession away. God doesn't do that. That's why we see the economic downturn before it's not like as if God didn't know. God is not shocked by economic downturn, but did He not promise for those who trust Him, He will provide. Amen. 
You have to believe that man, especially the man, you have to believe that he will provide. You say, Pastor, I'm going to see that with recession, drops are going to go down, opportunities are going to go down, finance is going to go down, economy is going to go down. But who owns the world? So you put your trust in the Lord, this verse will apply. You're like a tree planted. It doesn't matter whether there's heat, you don't have to be anxious even when there's drought around the land because, brothers, may the Lord water you. Amen. Can all the men say amen? You see, you see let, let, me, let me test this out. Ladies, do you trust in the Lord and the women say? Men, come on, do better. Men, will you trust in the Lord and the men say? All right, that's a good job. Give yourself a hand, all right? I, I couldn't hear Tampanese because I'm here, so, but I, I, I'm, I'm just guessing that Tampanese is saying amen, okay? All you men in Tampanese. Second point, write this down. Remain in Christ. 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 It, it's not a cliche theological word. Let me just go through very quickly. John 15, 5. Look at what Jesus says. He says, I'm the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is... Him that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. I, I have to believe that. You have to believe that for the simplest reason. You must see the picture of branches by itself is dead. Branches by itself changes color from a vibrant, lively color. It, it begins to die off. It becomes ash color. It becomes black and darkened. It, 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 there's no vibrancy to it. You, you see like the water and the nutrients are out. A branch severed from the vine or severed from the tree dies. And that's not good. So again, men, women, this, this is for both again, remain in Christ. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? I'm a Christian, I come to church. Let's go further. You have to purpose, we have to purpose that, okay, Father, I want to go deeper with you somewhere along the line. I have to start somewhere. And this is not something I want to pressure you, rather I want to encourage you. And I want you to be convicted that you have to find a way to say, in the upcoming season, I'm going to really dedicate time to really plant myself in Jesus. Like, I don't want Jesus to be a foreign God to me. Whereby there's a touch and go point, but it's not like embracing. You know what I mean? Touch and go. All of us have touch and go friends. Hey, hey, how are you, man? Bye, right? Touch and go. Jesus cannot be touch and go. Because you think about it, touch, go. Go means the branch is out. Touch and go is not good when it comes to the Lord. For ours must be touch Jesus and hold on. Cling on and say, Father, cling on to me as well. Because if it's left to my own devices, I will let go. But hold on to me, Father. Bring me back to the root of my salvation, bring me back to the tree of life, bring me back to where you are, bring me back Jesus because you are the vine and if I'm apart from you, your word says and clearly I cannot do anything. I cannot do anything. You say, but pastor, I can do something. Of course you can, but it's in your own strength and again, I need you to remember the point number one. The blessings you can have by your own strength is so limited. It's not what you know, friends. It's literally who you know. You know what? Even for me, in my life, I've seen that to be the case. There have been things I've been trying to do, and my wife would testify to that. And it's like, I can't do any of these things. And then suddenly, God opens a door, and someone becomes a channel of blessing to me. And I see God's hand in that. I don't say that I have the blessing on my own. I see God's hand to show me, Pacer, my son, you don't know what to do. But you trust me, I'll open the door for you and someone else can step in and give you that blessing. Friends, I know you have seen that in your life as well, but keep on going, right? You will remain in Christ. We would be rooted in Him. Let's get to two more points. Point C, write this down. Do not take part in unfruitful works of darkness. Point C, write this down. You say, Pastor, I want to see fruit in my life. The question of fruitfulness it's also what are you planting in? See, it's not enough to just say, I'm throwing all my seeds around and I just hope it's going to grow. If you recall, Jesus gave the parable of the four different soils. 
So, if, for instance, I, I take some seeds and I say, okay, I want to grow bananas, all right, or whatever fruit I want to grow, and I put it in wrong conditions. Say, some seeds I throw into concrete. Some seeds I throw into cement. It's not going to grow, no matter how many seeds I go. Like, that's the crazy part. So, I could take the seeds and I keep throwing in, hey, cement, come on. How come you're not growing? All right, I could take the seeds and throw in some place and I think it's good. I could take the seeds and throw on this stage. Nothing is going to grow, friends. I need to put it in living soil. I need to put it in a place where it's conducive to grow. And this is the picture of understanding why the Bible is going to say, don't take part in unfruitful works. Now, here, here's a point. Some of us want to get ahead. We know there are dirty, unscrupulous, sinful ways to get ahead, don't you? You could think of many ways to scam and scheme to get ahead. And maybe for a while it might work. Short while. Eventually we get caught in this earth or we get judged in the next place. Like there's no way out for that. It's not going to work long term. You might fool everyone. Like there's been some documentaries recently that is really uh, amazing, right? Some people that try to pretend. There was this lady, right? that you watch on Netflix, she pretended to be an heiress. So everywhere she's going, she's like trying to say she's rich, right? She has money tucked in somewhere. And guess what? She did fool a lot of people, powerful, influential, rich people, until finally she got caught. See, at the end of the day, that's not fruitful because it's no longevity. Like for instance, if you want to say, Pastor, I'm going to do well, I want to see finance flow in. You don't want to sleep at night and thinking, oh, oh, is the police coming? Are the creditors coming, man? Are, are, are the loan sharks coming, man? You can't have a proper sleep, even if you say, Pastor, wow, I can imagine these crooks, they could live in a penthouse. They, these crooks could have the best suite in any hotel. But you can imagine the fear wrapped up. Even though it's a beautiful facade, the heart is like, uh-oh, who's knocking at the door? Who's coming to bang it down? Who's coming to take it all away? We want to have, a, hopefully, a clear conscience, integrity, hopefully, hopefully, by the Lord's grace, integrity, earning and seeing fruitfulness without going into ways where not only we will shame the Father, not only would we have a bad conscience, it's, it's tremendously painful when the time of reckoning comes for our families. It's very painful, very, very, very painful, where our children, our grandchildren, our wives, would be shame because we let them down. It would be shame because we went to unfruitful works. Check out what it says in Ephesians 5, 11. And this is for everyone, obviously. It says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Now, the exposing here, it's not about shaming people. Let me just say very quickly, the exposing them is, is important because sometimes we need to know right and wrong. And the issue with knowing right and wrong is if we don't practice it, next time right becomes wrong and wrong becomes right. You give it a longer period of time, the moral landscape in our soul shifts. So, so i give an example. Let's say there's a chance for me to get a sum of money in an illegitimate way and maybe I think it's very safe. No one will know. Right? So let's say the first time I think about that, whoa, I see 20,000 on the floor, let's say, okay? And the words are saying it's unfruitful. But I'm like, 20,000, I could do a lot, you know? I could buy Racer and Rainbow, some very cool stuff. I could, wow, I could save up for my retirement. And so I pass it by every day. If I don't expose it in my own heart, over time, I might not realize it's wrong. Because the heart wants what the heart wants. So I need to say, I expose it, this is unfruitful. This is not good. There's some good in the money here, but the way to get it is wrong. Expose them. Father, I need your help, please. I, I'm, I'm drawn. There's temptation. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. For instance, if you go overseas to do business, in some nations, the minute you give bribery, you get ahead. That's the truth. Not naming any nations, right? I'm just saying it's true. 
You get to hear that very often. And here's the worst part though. This is what happens even to the Christian, right? Pastor, all my friends do it, you know, and they're getting ahead. I cannot be the only swaku, right, that stay here, pass by this money on the floor and just refuse to. I can't be the only dumb person, right? I'm going to say something that I hope would help you. Be that dumb person then. Be innocent of sin as, as best as we can. Father, please help me. Heavenly Father. All my friends are doing it. The business world sees it. It's fine. No one frowns upon it. It seems okay. It's an acceptable, normal practice, though it's not supposed to be. Okay, let me join in. Unfruitfulness. At a certain point, I'm not, I'm not kidding, at a certain point, if we participate, at a certain point, we're going to see the payback of our sin. We really will. That's why the Bible is so clear in different places that we will be judged or we will suffer loss. Short-term gain, really long-term payback. Like so many examples in the Bible, but David is one of the classic ones. His short time of unfruitful pleasure brought so much pain. Like the pain is not worth it. Not worth it at all. If you see David's life, not worth it. That enjoyment for that short period of time doesn't outweigh the long-term effects of sin. And so, gentlemen, especially you are the men in your home, this is a verse for us all, right? Gentlemen, especially, take no part in unfruitful works of darkness. Now, I know the follow-up question will be, Pastor, if I don't join in, right, I lose out. This is why you need to go back to the first point. What does the first point say? Trust steadfastly in the Lord. I, I show you what I mean. You see everyone taking this 20,000 and going, 20,000 and going. They're just taking it and going. And you're seeing them short-term, short-term gain. Wow, they're promoted. Oh, my. Wow, bigger house. Man. Oh, my. And then you're looking at yourself and saying, hmm, I don't see any. Like, that, that describes the Broadway, by the way. The Broadway looks like instant success, but it leads down to destruction later on. You can't see it yet, though. It's like, it's like going on a nice uh, river ride until you realize, oh boy, at the end, it's a rushing waterfall down to your death. You're going to get plunged in and you're going to dash on the rocks. The Bible actually says and elsewhere that he who trusts in the Lord, your feet will not be dashed on the rock. So this looks good for now, for sure. Like Jesus already explained the Broadway looks really good. That's why you and I have to hold steady and say, God, you need to help me. Because I will be lying to you to say, we are not tempted. Temptation is real, folks. Okay, if, a, if you are a Christian and you say, Pastor, is temptation a sin? Temptation is not a sin, the Bible says. The sin is actually committing the temptation, right? Actually going with the temptation. At the point of temptation, we have to commit ourselves to God and say, Father, I need your help, please. I feel like my morals are going to be tested. I feel like I'm going down the way that looks good. But I know that this is not good. And friends, the faster you catch yourself on that, the quicker you stay on the right ground. But you might not see success so quick. I agree. Can I, can I tell this to you? You might not see success so quick compared to one in the Broadway. Because the guy in the Broadway is willing to do nearly anything. There's, there's, there's this statement, including sell his, mom, sell, sell his mom's kidneys and organs, right? Like, he's willing, unscrupulous ways, whatever way to get money, just go. But the Christian has to think about God. In Joseph's words, how can I do this before my king? How, how can I do this? How can I do this? It, it affects him. So that's the right spirit. And we get to the final point. See, short sermon, right? Final point. Do not give up in doing good. Now, this is a point I want to spend a bit of time. Brothers, again, back to the point. You say, Pastor, I'm not gaining. I see people running by and they're grabbing that and they're going. And I'm stuck here in my narrow gate, in my narrow way. And that's why there's this verse. This is one of my favorite verses. I, about 15 years ago, this became one of my favorite verses. And there was actually one of my former teachers 
she didn't, she didn't know me for a long time, but one day she felt like the Lord was speaking to her. And so she wrote me an email and said, hey, Pastor Pesa, I'm actually, you know, your uh, secondary school teacher. And she said she has a word of the Lord for me. And she, she wrote me certain things. And one of the verses was this, Galatians 6, 9. Check out what it says. Let us not grow weary of doing good. This is such a huge verse. For in due season, we will reap, reap a harvest if we do not give up. I, I want you to camp on this, especially brothers, please camp on this. You say, Pastor, doing good is very laborious and it's very tiring and it's very uh, painful. And doing good, uh, no one understands because you are the one that is different from the rest. I, I, I totally understand this. Like, for instance, Noah was trying to do good. The Bible says he's a preacher of righteousness. And for about 100 years, he was building an ark at a time when there's no rain. It's a very weird thing. So you can imagine if we were friends of Noah, we're thinking he's insane. And I think a Noah would appreciate a verse like this. Let us not be weary in doing good. Year one, year 90, Oh gosh, is rain ever going to come? Am I building this huge wooden ark for nothing? Like, what am I doing here? And can I share this with you, brothers? That's how some of you feel. Like, you're saying things, I feel stuck. I feel like I can't go anywhere. I have no man's land. If I go backwards, I'm demoted. If I go forward, I need to be going the broad way. Like, how am I going to navigate? And I tell you, in the place, in the absence of clear wisdom, there is still the idea of biblical submission. What I mean is this. Sometimes we're waiting for the next sign. I'm not saying it's bad. We're waiting for the next word. Father, can you, can you tell me what's next? But in the absence of a word, we stick on with the plan of God. I'll give you one example. King Saul should have stuck with the plan of God. He knew that he's supposed to wait for Samuel to come and he did not wait long enough. So he waited one, two days, three days, four days. It's like he's tired of waiting. And then he went ahead presumptuously, right? And that's what Samuel said. The first thing he said to King Saul, you acted foolishly, you acted presumptuously. You should have just waited upon that last instruction. You say, Pastor, what's my last instruction? Let us not grow weary in doing good. But Pastor, I really feel very tired now. Tell it to the Lord. Father, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I've been planting on this vineyard. Look, Father, my vineyard is much smaller than all my friends. Sound familiar? Why me, Lord? Sound, sound familiar? But here, here's the good news. As you plant on your vineyard and you keep on going, steady, faithfully, assuredly, just putting your trust in the Lord, that's point number one. Abiding in Christ, that's point number two. Avoiding the fruitful works of darkness, that's point number three. The fourth point is what? Just keep going. At a certain point in time, you start to see pesticides coming into other fields, not because you are wishing them ill, but because the Lord allowed the enemy to destroy what seemed to be profitable at the start. See, everything looks good at the start. The Tower of Babel looks good as it was rising up. But the hearts were evil, right? They wanted to show God that we can dethrone you. Until at a certain point, God said, nah, it's time to stop it. He stops it. But we would say, Lord, why didn't you stop the unfruitful work when the first brick was put? See, God doesn't operate this way. Faith doesn't just come like that. Otherwise, there's no need for faith. You say, Pastor, I need faith. Exactly. To trust in the Lord, you need faith. To believe that when I'm planting in my vineyard, no matter how sparse or bare or barren it looks, if God is for me, who can be against me? Father, I need your help. Okay, I'm going to wait it out. I'm just planting. I'm planting. It's not growing as fast, Lord. These guys got chemicals to make it faster. But where did the chemicals come from? See, like, no one wants the organic growth, right? Because we want it fast. For instance, an example, chickens, if you naturally breed them, it's different. But some companies want to 
right? Inject things so that the chicken becomes what? Fatter and seemingly juicier. But guess what happens though when we eat those kind of things? It's unprofitable, unfruitful works. See, the thing that takes the longest time, the slowest time, many times is actually the right way in God's eyes. So you're fruitful, you're faithful in your own vineyard. And at a certain point, friend, you have to trust in the word of the Lord. He will give you fruit. You say, Pastor, I don't believe. You have to though. Look at the verse again, please. Check it out. Let this be your life verse as well. For especially the men, let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season. Due season. Doesn't say when. So keep, keep on going. Keep on going. You know, some of the greatest testimonies, I don't have time for that, but some of the greatest testimonies I've heard is literally that story. Someone that is innocuously working, just doing what he can or what she can. And then later on, the lifetime of what he or she did made so much impact, even in the Christian world. And later on, people look at it and say, wow, that is, a, that is an example of faithfulness. But can I say one thing here before we pray? You say, but pastor, I am weary now. So I need some help, pastor. I need some help because, man, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm looking there and I see, wow, and I'm still stuck. So I'm tired, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm weary. Why does Paul say, don't grow weary? So where is the help coming from? You know the answer. You already know the answer. It's the Lord, right? Father, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. Lord, did you not promise strength? Do you not promise sustenance? Do you not promise that you'll give me a way when there's no way? So what happens? You go back to square one. Right? You go back to the Father. You go back to be rooted in the Lord. You go back to abiding in Christ. You go back to shunning evil. You go back to faithfulness. I don't want to grow weary. I'm going to just keep going. And you know what? Can I say this over you? It's not even a prophecy per se. It's just a biblical prophetic thing. If you can do what Galatians 6, 9 says, friend, brother, sister, at a certain point, the fruits that will come in as the Bible says in Malachi, it would be bigger, wider, greater than even your barn house can contain. If you believe that, can someone say a good amen? Can I ask you, how many of you want to see fruits in your life? I want to see, okay? I want to see. Like, can I, can I share with you very personally as we cl- come to a close? You say, Pastor Pesa, what about you? What kind of fruits do you want in your life? For me, there's a few compartments, right? Uh, for me, personally, I want to see that I, 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 for me, okay, for me, I hope that I can say at the end of my days that I did serve the Lord in His purpose. I hope I can say that. I hope I can say that I, I did love the Lord and did what He asked. I hope I can say that. For my family, I have also hopes for my wife and my children. And by God's grace, hopefully the Lord will help me to be a better father, right? Better husband. I have, I have hopes for you guys. You, you guys are, are my sheep. I'm privileged to be your pastor. I want to see God bless your life. But friend, I can't give you a shortcut. Because if I give you a shortcut, it doesn't end in blessings. It it ends in pain. The long way and the narrow way is Jesus, is, is Father God. It's clinging on to what He has, is going by His way. And then you would see legitimate, organic, beautiful, supernatural growth and fruits in your life. I have also hopes for this nation that we would see a unity amongst churches in Singapore because when the true unity comes, friends, the revival club will come, really. Like there's going to be a revival that will sweep this land. I have hopes, but all this takes time, you know. Unity doesn't just come by, let's all be united. It takes work. It takes effort. So these are my hopes, right? For you, your hopes could be different. But where is the place where we can find strength is the Lord. And would you all stand as we close in prayer? 
I, I think I need to pray for one thing, which I know it's a real thing. And I want you to be honest with God. You, can we all close our eyes for a moment? I, I need to know how many of you really feel this. Can you close your eyes? No one looking around. This is only for your pastor to see. I need to see. Tell me the truth, friends. How many of you feel exhausted in trying to do good? No one looking around. I see your hand. I see your hand. Wow. I see your hand. I see your hand. Wow. Japanese, I see your hand. Wow. Okay, put your hands down. The Lord knows. Okay, listen close. The Lord knows your tiredness. The Lord knows your weariness. And now is the time for us to trust Him. Can we do that? Can we lift up our hands together, every one of us? Come on, we ask for His strength. Father, we want to see fruits in our life. I want to see that. Moms and fathers in this house want to see that. We want to see the fruits of our labor, oh God. That our family is prosperous and blessed. In all ways, oh God, that we should not be begging for bread. Lord, we, we need to have finance. We're not praying to be unrighteously rich. We're praying that indeed you supply all our needs. Father, I ask for that right now. Lord, for some of us, we're in two jobs, three jobs. We're fighting poverty. We're fighting the issues. But Lord, we need that supply. Oh God, help us. Your word says, let us not grow weary in doing good. Brother, sister, we receive that right now. Father, strengthen us again. Strengthen us again. Strengthen our bones, oh God. Strengthen our heart, our minds. Tomorrow is a fresh day. Tomorrow is temptation again to do wrong. There are shortcuts all around. The broad way looks so tempting. Father, please help us. While we are tempted at times, draw us to that place where true provision, true strength, true life comes. We pray right now, Lord, that it's who we know. Oh God, we know you. We want to know you more. As we abide in Jesus, we know that the blessings will come. Can I ask you to lift up your hands just a little bit more? I'm going to pray for the blessings of God to come. But friend, hear me now. As I pray the blessings of God upon our lives, I'm not talking about shortcut. I'm just saying prophetically, we say, for instance, Lord, we need the finance. Friend, hear me now as you lift up your hands. When I say, Lord, we need the finance, it also means you need to be faithful. Friend, hear this, please. God is not going to throw money to you and you're going to be faithlessly using it. God wants you to be a good steward, okay? So let's lift up our hands right now. Father, we ask for the favour of the Lord to come upon all of us. Please, oh God, your favour in finance right now, we receive it in Jesus' name. We receive it. Help us to steward it. Lord, your favour in our households, oh God, that our children and our children's children will come to know Jesus. We receive it right now. Come on, we receive it. Father, we receive also, Lord, all your goodness and all the benefits of Jesus right this moment. We receive it, Lord. Bless us. Lord, bless our families with a good name. We don't need to have a famous name, but we want to have a good name filled with integrity and life. Lord, we receive it. We receive it in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for more strength. Lord, some of us feel like we're falling flat. And tomorrow it feels like we have no strength. But in Jesus' name, men, brothers, sisters, ladies, receive the strength of the Lord now to do what you need to do so that we're not growing weary. At a proper time, we're going to see the harvest. Now, friends, you are receiving it by faith, the harvest. Look at me, look at me. You're receiving the harvest by faith. Can you say that with me right now? I receive the harvest by faith. I receive the harvest by faith. Say it again. I receive the harvest by faith. Please hear this next statement because I don't, want, I don't want us to misunderstand. We receive it by faith. We still got to put in the effort. The Lord said, I'll give you the land of milk and honey, but it doesn't mean you don't fight for it. So now we receive it, right? Lord, I receive your favor, but we still got to partner with the Lord on this. Okay, say it again. I receive the blessings of God. Can you believe that? Please believe that. I receive the blessings of God. Hey, friend. If you're a child of God, the Lord loves you. You're already blessed. Amen. Can I give you one quick story? I, I, I feel like I have to, okay, just a quick one. Then we'll sing the song and we're out of here. And then we can go and eat, okay? You, you know, you read stories of fathers that are very rich, like a Jackie Chan. So rich, millionaire, many times over. But saying that he doesn't want his kids to grow up with a pampered mindset. Just an example. So what does he want them to do? To work. There are many fathers like that, that they know that money can corrupt. 
because those fathers they 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 worked hard to get where they are but their children with the blessings that didn't come with hard work what happens pampered ill mannered not a heart of gratitude you see if the Bible says, if we who are wicked fathers on earth know how to give good things to our children, how much more the great heavenly father. Some of us friends, your next payday and the next blessing flow is just around the corner, but you say, pastor, how do I get it? Don't give up. Don't give up. If you are gonna give up right now, it's all gone. It's like starting three years in medicine and then giving up on the fourth year. It's like you're about to close up the project and then you decide we're going to just tear down the whole building. Don't give up. Don't grow weary. You're going to see a ripening of that reward. So right now, once again, lift up your hands right now. I want you to believe and say, I receive the blessing. Come on. I receive the blessing. Come on, say it again. Lord, I receive your favor. I receive your strength. And good people of Lighthouse, may that come to pass May the Lord bless us bountifully in Jesus' name. And all of us give the Lord praise. Amen.